Excellent. Um, so welcome tonight to the November 5th Hadley School uh, Committee meeting. Is there a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Mara. <clears throat> hey, Mara. We're just getting started. Hi, Heather. Hi. All right, are there any adjustments to the agenda for tonight? When we uh, review the public health data, I will also update the school committee on our decision regarding participating in the pilot for Abbott the next now testing. Great. Other Thanks, that, Annie. No. Okay. Then we will move into public comment. Um, as we have been doing, we have, uh, please raise your digital hand if you would like to speak during public comment. Uh, and if you are on the phone, if you want to come off mute and uh, unmute and just indicate you want to uh, participate in public comment, I see our first uh, public comment, Allison Donta Venman. Allison? Hi, thank you. I have a comment about the cohort learning. I have two kids at Hopkins and they, so they've been back in person uh, in the cohort model for the past two weeks. And uh, this week we ran into something that I think was maybe unanticipated, which is test taking. So mm -hmm. it was a little rough this week. Um, I had my ninth grader request to stay home two days. One day she had a math test and she felt that it would be uh, disruptive when all the other kids are talking, right? So if you're taking a math test in a normal math class, everyone's taking the math class, the math test, and it's quiet. So she stayed home the whole day so she could take her math test in quiet. And tomorrow she will be home because apparently to take a French test, mm -hmm. you don't talk to the French teacher, you have to record yourself. And she was worried that the ambient sounds from the other kids would make her recording not come through. So I think that is something that maybe was unanticipated. Uh, I didn't anticipate it either, but it was um, takes a little bit more planning on the part of the kids in the family to say, do I have a test? Do I need to stay home? So. Very helpful, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, I know I, I don't see uh, Ms. Camuso or, um, on the line, but Annie, I, I'm assuming you will follow up with her on that. Oh, absolutely. Thank you very, very much. And thank you for recognizing, even when things seem like they should have been glaringly obvious, it's amazing how many things in hindsight are glaringly obvious and they're not in that moment. So thank you so much for um, your presentation of that. And I will follow up with Ms. Camuso first thing tomorrow. She can't join us this evening. Ms. Dowd may be joining us uh, in just a few minutes. She had an appointment this afternoon, but thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Allison. McKenzie, I'm here. Oh, there she Hi, is. <laughs> Hi guys. Great. All right. Um, I'll just lower the hand. Are there any other public comment participants for this evening? Okay, then we will dive right into our agenda for tonight. Uh, we have presentation and discussion items we will move into. The first one is the presentation of NSDC Academic Growth and Student Leadership Award. Yes, so I have the pleasure this evening and I believe that we have Karen Cullen with us this evening and I do see some other Cullens with us as well. So this is an absolute pleasure. Karen Cullen, has been nominated for and is the recipient of the NESDEC Award for Academic Growth and Student Leadership. Uh, academically, Karen has taken some of the most difficult courses that Hopkins Academy offers. Karen has successfully taken seven advanced placement courses. He's enrolled in five additional AP courses for his senior year, an independent study in multivariable calculus, and plans to take the assessment of performance towards proficiency in languages, otherwise known as the Apple exam, in order to obtain a certificate of biliteracy in Spanish. He has never received a grade below an A and often helps his classmates with assignments. He has also pursued mechanical engineering projects 
and competed in various science fairs. He was accepted to work alongside Dr. Roderick Gruppen on a robotics project at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Karen was selected as one of 15 national finalists in the 2020 John F. Kennedy Profiles in Courage essay contest and is a semi-finalist for the National Merit Scholarship Program. In addition to Kieran's incredibly busy academic schedule, he dedicates countless hours to serving his school and the greater Hadley community through multiple volunteer endeavors. Kieran is the president of our service organization, the Key Club. He plans meetings for the club and seeks out various service projects. Kieran and his fellow officers doubled club membership through outreach and recruitment efforts. He does not shy away from leadership and service opportunities, and he's the first to lend a hand if peers or the community are in need. He is clearly a leader. He's also a co-leader of our peer mentor program. He's a positive role model for his younger peers and an individual of great integrity. So Karen, clearly uh, your academic accomplishments are, to say they're noteworthy is an understatement, um, but what of course, I'm most struck by is that you're just not satisfied with doing good by yourself and for yourself, but you want to do good for others. Um, the fact that you doubled enrollment, you and your fellow officers doubled enrollment in a service organization at a high school is just so impressive. Um, what leadership, a, a, a good leadership, is when our own actions are responsible, helpful, impactful, and kind and wise, but when we encourage others to act that way as well, and that's just so powerful. Karen, I'm really proud to be your superintendent, and I'm honored to present you this is presenting in COVID times to present you with the NASDAQ award, which will be uh, brought to Hopkins or Mail directly to you. Um, so congratulations, thank you. And certainly if you would like to say anything, we would love to hear from you. I gotta find you if you wanna. Yes, thank you. It's, it's an honor to receive this award and be recognized in this way. I really appreciate it. So thank you to everyone. Thank you. Congratulations. Congrats, congrats, congrats. Good congratulations, job. Karen. Great job. Karen, congratulations to you. Uh, I know your family and your community, your school are all very proud of you. Um, personally, I've had opportunity to see you in action on the robotics field and in other forums, and your leadership has been outstanding. So I thank you for representing Hopkins and your community. Uh, in the way that you do, uh, and just congratulate you on this award. And Bob and Christine, I know that you're very proud. So I appreciate all of you uh, being able to see you uh, for this presentation. So thank you. Well done, Karen. Well done. All right, great. Um, let's move to the next uh, topic, which is the update on the phase and preliminary planning for phase three. Uh, which then leads into the review of the public health data and testing. So Annie, I will turn it over to you. Actually, I am going to, because Ms. Dowd is here, we can start with an update from the perspective of Hadley Elementary School, and then I can report on an update from Hopkins Academy. So Ms. Dowd, are you with us? And would you like to talk a little bit about how, how things are progressing in phase two, some of the real-time problem solving folks have been doing that I'm so impressed with, and our families have helped with and all that good stuff. Are you here? She is here. Here you are. I am here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes. Oh, wonderful. I apologize. I'm actually um, uh, at an appointment right now. And so that's why I'm off camera, but I'm here to give the update of phase two, which has been um, ongoing. And we are currently planning for phase three. But phase two is, um, we started on October 26, bringing back roughly uh, close to 200 students. And so I just first have to thank 
um, the community, the families, the parents, the uh, staff, um, Hadley Fire Department, Hadley Police Department for working on several things with us. Um, one thing that we've been working on is the arrival and dismissal. I know that's um, presented with some feedback and some challenges. Uh, almost doubling our cars. We have approximately 50 families that pick up and drop off every day. And so we had to work really, really closely with the fire and police around those adjustments that had to be done to make sure that things are safe and that kids are still socially distant. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to report that we've added some double lanes um, and it's really working out nicely, which, is, which has been helpful and, and good. Um, we also are working together as a group around recess. Um, we started a recess committee along with our arrival and dismissal committee. So we've been working together as a staff to make sure that those um, protocols of health and safety have been happening during our unstructured times. Um, and I just have to say that it, there's, nothing, <laughs> there's nothing greater than seeing um, the children out playing together. And so socially, it's been just wonderful to be able to see them um, speaking with their friends, even though they're masked. Um, just being able to be in their zones, but the fresh air and, and being able to see one another, it's just been, it's been wonderful. So, um, so we've been working together as a staff to make sure that we have those health and safety protocols around our unstructured times. We also um, have been problem solving around our day-to-day -day operations. So what students are traveling in the hallways, making sure that they're cohorted, making sure that they're staying where they're supposed to be, wearing masks, um, all of those health and safety protocols that we've been working so hard with our special population students, which I think has been very nice to be able to start off with a smaller group, and now we have a much larger group. Um, but just the first couple weeks have been just planning and making sure that students are, um, you know, adhering to the health and safety protocols, washing their hands. Um, if students are, are not feeling well, families have been amazing about either coming to get them or keeping them home. And so we've worked um, in collaboration with the, um, with the Department of Health, and along with our school nurse, Nurse Fuller, who's done a nice job of communicating with families. If students are appearing to not feel well, what are the next steps? Um, and so we've, we've worked really nice with, with over 20 families identifying um, should, should a student come in, should a sibling come in? Um, and so I just, um, I couldn't be more pleased with the way that families are responding and also our, our staff and our school community. I also have been working very nicely with HEA reps in our building who have been incredible to work with. Michelle Witowitz and Rebecca Jolinas have been coming to me and letting me know if there are things that um, have come up that we need to have further discussion on, um, making sure that we're working on phase three plans, which it just seems amazing to me that we're, we're already looking forward to the future. Um, and so I, I continue to maintain my office hours where staff can come and speak to me or we can do it by, through Zoom. Um, and some teachers have come to me with, with great questions. I try to, my best to find answers and work together and problem solve as a group. Um, our staff meeting this week was, was just um, a wonderful exercise in communication and problem solving and next steps. And um, so that's the update for phase two. We will be meeting next week to um, again, discuss what phase three might look like. Um, and I encourage anybody that has any questions or any feedback to contact me directly. I've been having wonderful conversations with families. Um, Dr. McKenzie has been in the building every day to speak with me. And um, we're really just trying to problem solve every single day and we've had to make some adjustments and I'm confident that we're gonna to continue to make those adjustments every week. We just um, really try to communicate and see, you know, what needs to be done for, to maintain the health and safety of all the students and staff. So I'm open for questions. If people have specific questions about what we've been doing at Hadley Elementary School. Um, and so feel free. Jen, this is Heather. I don't have any specific questions, but I know um, we're looking forward to in our next meeting talking about what phase three um, may encompass in terms of um, uh, at the elementary school as well as at Hopkins. This no, is Tara. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Tara. Um, I just had two questions. Um, sure. uh, this is Tara. 
Um, one of them is um, what percentage of, I forget what percentage of kids we have back and if we've already heard if um, additional kids are planning to come back for phase three. Yep. Um, and my second question is in regards to um, space utilization. Are, I, I don't remember if you said it last time or what, if I missed it, are we using the gym right now? Is everybody in a traditional classroom or? Great questions. So to answer your first part, we have approximately 192 students back in person with 58 remaining remote. Um, I have had some um, positive feedback from those 58 families. I will continue to serve, survey them when we get closer to the phase three dead uh, start date. Um, but of those 58, I have received feedback that they would like to uh, come back. And so I'm anticipating that we will have many more students of those 58 coming back in person. Um, but again, I will survey those families when we get closer so we get a solid number. Um, as far as all students being in traditional classrooms, they are all in traditional classrooms, which has been fantastic. Um, it took a collective effort um, with our custodial staff and our staff to make sure that we were um, make, having everything that we needed in the classrooms taken out for additional space if we needed it. Um, the priority was to fit as many students that wanted to come back in traditional classrooms. And so I'm happy to report that we are doing that. Um, we are not using the gym right now. Um, the only time that we use that gym is for dismissal and they're cohorted by um, uh, grades in the gym, but we're not using that gym currently. Um, for classroom space. Uh, we also were using it for a short time for indoor recess, but we've kind of paused on that and decided to do indoor recess in the classrooms until we can just, we want to just make sure that we're being cautious. And so uh, indoor recess has been happening in the classroom. And we'll continue to be so in, in phase two. And phase three might look a little different, but we're going to be problem solving um, we're going to be problem solving those things in the next couple of weeks. I also know that um, at our last meeting, I believe it was you, Tara, that had indicated that you would be interested in hearing some uh, general feedback from teachers. And I do believe that Michelle Watowitz, I believe both Becky and Michelle are here this evening, and I believe that Michelle may be prepared to uh, just share some of the feedback from what I believe was from HES, but Michelle, are you here? I am, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, yeah, Th thanks for having me. Um, teachers have, have been so pleased to have so many children back. Um, it's really brought a lot of joy to us in these challenging circumstances. Um, they've been doing some great quality work. Um, teachers obviously feel more comfortable with the delivery instruction and being in person. That's what we're trained to do. Um, it's the, there's an increase of student mastery and skills that way as well. And um, just smoother delivery of instruction um, and how the lesson flows. Um, and also we've noticed that students have been very creative in their thinking and problem solving with the new normal of COVID. Um, so it's just been really joyful to have a lot of them back. There have been some challenges and concerns, certainly. Um, I think the workload continues to be the biggest challenge um, that teachers are faced with juggling both. Um, all of us do continue to have some in person and some remotely. So um, the planning for and the execution of all of those lessons um, is a lot. And the, uh, the additional stress that on any given day, a staffing can be a concern. Um, it, it is just that, as I said, is an additional um, stress on people. We don't have any open teaching positions at this time, but on any given day, um, you know, there's a number who could be out and that, you know, impacts the flow of everything and um, the concern for our neediest students who may need additional support at any given time. I know the district has posted these positions um, and, and we appreciate the efforts um, to hire new, but unfortunately there's not a lot of people out there right now who want to sub <laughs> in school buildings during COVID. Um, but yeah, we're, we're very pleased um, overall with how phase two has gone. Um, Becky, did I forget anything? <laughs> yeah. I think that covers it. Okay. Thanks. I'm happy to answer any questions too. Thank you. Um, I, I have a 
one question. Um, I know when we went into this newest phase, there were concerns on the part of um, families who were remote who thought their um, children would be receiving sort of an uh, equal education to what they had been receiving initially and would be receiving uh, if they were in person. And I, um, I um, heard some grumblings in the uh, on uh, in, in different quarters about that um, that that they may not get that my children are in Hopkins Academy so they're still sort of remote and cohorted and their experience hasn't changed in this phase so I don't have firsthand experience of how how that um, played out and what you're hearing from parents um, and um, whether that has shifted at all from what we thought would be the case going in. Uh, so teachers were tasked with um, setting up their, their schedules and what that looked like. It's my understanding that every effort was made to provide as much synchronous time um, and keep it as close to what it had been during phase one for those students. Um, I, that, that is not something I collected feedback. So be, beyond that, I may not be the best person to answer that question. Um, that may have to go to Annie or Jen. Um, but I know teachers have made every effort to provide as much um, instructional time um, as possible to those students. I can certainly speak to now one is not a focused group, but uh, it is anecdotal and I think it's also illustrative. So I know that there was a parent who, who expressed initially significant concern along the lines that you're describing, Humera, and then um, was pleasantly um, surprised when the parent looked a little more closely at the schedule and saw what was happening. So again, one individual is not a focus group, but uh, that certainly is feedback that I've been privy to. And I do know, um, so the short answer is we haven't like surveyed in any kind of official capacity. I wouldn't expect, and I know Humeria didn't direct it at teachers per se, I wouldn't expect uh, teachers to collect that kind of data. It's certainly something that we could look to get specific feedback from parents on. And that's something that, um, that's something Jen and I can talk about doing going forward. I also would like to, um, sorry, I, I cut okay. out for a minute there, but um, I would like to highlight the work that we did um, during those two remote days um, where teachers were able to prepare a schedule. Um, and we shared that out throughout the building so that teachers could really look at what other teachers were doing. I know that was a concern um, that we wanted to make sure that we were providing consistent opportunities from kindergarten all the way up to grade six. So that, you know, one grade level wasn't, you know, going, you know, providing more than another. So we really wanted to see what made sense considering we had the bulk of children in person. But of course, we've always said that our remote learners still belong to us. And so we wanted to make sure that we were making schedules that would support them. Um, I've also been able to use um, Mr. Richards, who are, is a, our math interventionist, um, to be able to provide some more one-on-one um, -on -one time with students in, spe in specific groups. Um, and so we really worked hard in those two days to identify what should our schedule look like. Um, and I think the first week there was definitely some feedback of wondering, you know, how is this going to work? Um, some families reached out to me personally and said, I'm nervous. And I said, just give it the week. You got, you have to give it the week. You have to live the schedule. We're, we're trying to figure out this balance that almost at some, some days feels impossible. Um, but I am happy to report because I do follow back with those families that they, they do feel supported and they don't, they, they're not as isolated as they once had um, anticipated that they would be. And so we'll continuously check in with them and make sure that they
they're finding a healthy balance. But I also want to recognize the work that teachers are doing to go above and beyond to make sure that those remote learners do not feel isolated. So there are certain teachers that want to, um, you know, provide opportunities where they're Zooming with kids so that they can see direct instruction in real time. And so we've been trying to, to balance that given the age level and also the curriculum expectations. So um, I'm happy to report that after you know, we're, we're at the end of our second week of doing this, that um, the feedback has been positive. And if there have to be adjustments, the staff is willing and open to do that. That's terrific. Thank you, Michelle, um, Becky, and, and Jen for, um, and also Annie, for providing that context. Um, I think, it, you know, so long as we're um, consistently going back out to our parents and um, closing that feedback loop. Annie, you mentioned a survey. I think that could be helpful, especially before we move phases um, and just ensuring that we're striking the right balance of uh, equity between learners. It is an inordinate amount of work. I'm seeing that not only at Hadley um, Public Schools, but also across the nation, um, mm -hmm. just juggling in person and Zoom hybrid. It's just it's a teachers working till late at night, uh, you know, grading on on. Um, it's just an inordinate amount of work. Um, whatever we can do to think smarter about you know how we help understandable that there isn't a glut of people looking to become um, full-time employees during COVID, but maybe there's another way that we're not thinking about. And I, I know we're very creative um, about um, imagining those ways. I, I'm uh, super interested in hearing more ideas about how we might augment our teachers capacity to um, to do this work and so thank you I just um, I appreciate your keeping an eye on that specific um, issue um, I'm so grateful that we went remote first for the purpose of organizing ourselves online for the purpose of having things in a Google classroom for the purpose of being able to manage students in a remote situation and in person and also seeing the numbers increasing who knows what's going to happen in the coming weeks. So again, I just thank the teachers for being ready for whatever comes our way. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Um, and th thank you for acknowledging the, the workload. Um, we, we appreciate you recognizing that, all of you, and uh, we do look forward, the ATA does look forward to um, speaking directly with the school committee as we move into phase three. And Annie, I think it is helpful in Jen to, um, to get feedback. I know I, ATA representatives might not be able to come to every meeting, but I'm thinking at least monthly, you know, it was nice to know almost two weeks into phase two was a really big change for teachers and staff and kids. Um, so just getting feedback from teachers and making sure that we're um, acknowledging any concerns or things that are going well too continuously again as we move into phase three and as things shift just getting that feedback from staff um, well, our, just, our okay. ATA reps have been committed so I'm sure they will be <laughs> commit them every time but we'll make sure that minimum of at least once a month and of course they're always welcome and typically they're at school committee meetings anyways so yeah, I, I know we're, we're always conscientious about survey fatigue for parents, yes. but in this situation where everything's changing so rapidly, I think we cannot under, we cannot over survey. I really feel it's important just to keep our feelers out there and be getting information. Even, I love that you're getting it anecdotally, Jen. I also think we need to just, you know, um, find um, additional paths for parents to submit even anonymously what they're really experiencing, just providing that pathway. I completely agree with you, Humera. I think that that's extremely important, especially when we're talking about equity and making sure that it's not just the families that reach out to me, but that I'm doing the work and that we're all doing the work to survey the families that are underrepresented by their, um, you know, whether they're busy working or they have other challenges. Um, I, I want to make a commitment to them as well. And so I don't want to forget them. And um, I, I will make it a commitment to make sure that I survey and, and try to get all of that information back so that we can make 
solid decisions about what's going to meet the needs of all of our students. Just to add to that too, um, I know that you know, we do have a contact form on the um, school committee website page where folks can reach out to us. Um, and we have received inquiries from parents, clar clarifications needed from parents, um, very specific questions, which we've been able to represent um, maintaining that confidentiality, but really preserving that, but at least getting some, some clarification. So if folks are concerned about that, please reach out to us. We are happy to help address and, and get you know answers to the questions that you may have or even just additional information if something is unclear uh, without necessarily um, speaking to it as a particular person that is making that request. And I do have uh, a bit of an update from Hopkins. So I can share that with the school committee and the public as well. So right now, uh, this is in phase Two, there are just under 80 students, I think, because it just went up today. Some more middle schoolers uh, have returned. Um, but as they start thinking about phase three, the next phase, because for Hopkins, we know a big sticking point is the, are the challenges of delivering remote in-person instruction. Uh, so Allison Donta Vindman gave us one example of that, taking tests, which I, I really, you know, that's, that's a great example of things that we'll think through and uh, try to come up with better alternatives for that. But also we recognize that students are eager to follow their schedule, their normal schedule, and teachers are, they, they enjoy teaching students face to face. Again, our teachers applied to work in Hadley Public Schools, not Greenfield Virtual School District. So their preference is to teach face to face. If that weren't their preference, they would have applied in a virtual school district. So, at, but at the same time, um, certainly the staff, and not just the staff, not just the faculty in the HEA, but also the leadership. So we have concerns about increasing numbers which we imagine that the numbers would increase exponentially if students were able to follow their regular schedule so potentially then what you're looking at is students saying and families saying oh we'll come back now because the regular schedule is happening and so you there's this potential to introduce multiple variables at one time mixing increase in numbers other aspects of the plan so one thing that's happening right now is are the, the faculty, the teachers and building leadership uh, in both buildings, because it's a district plan, are talking about one, looking at what did we plan for in the summer? Of course, we wrote these plans trying to imagine what it would look like to deliver instruction in a COVID reality. So what did we write in the summer? What's actually happening in practice, as Jen points out, we've had to make countless adjustments to arrival, dismissal. I mean, that, that is like a, an advanced science now. Uh, greeting and dismissing an elementary school, it's probably the most complex task in a district. We've had to think through recess, another very complex task in COVID. So we'll look at the plan and we will share with uh, the public and the committee things that have had to change in practice. The faculty and building leadership and the district leadership will look at what we had planned for phase three and identify any concerns. I gave you examples of one thing that we, we would really be, we really wanna think long and hard about, and I'm speaking for myself now, I don't speak for the entire leadership of the HAA, I'm gonna speak for myself. I get pretty nervous if I think about introducing multiple variables all at once. So we're thinking through which variable should be the priority and how do we safely introduce that? And I'll underscore again right now, uh, the, H, the Hadley Education Association, the faculty, building leaders are thinking about this, talking about it. And then what would happen is that the, to the extent that we were recommending adjustments, that the HEA would have direct conversations with the school committee about that and uh, we talk about what makes sense and then um, deliberate over those things uh, publicly. So those, that, those discussions are underway that involves surveying you know, staff and talking to students and 
Ms. Camacho does intend to have a presentation for the school committee on November 19th, but I, I don't want people thinking on November 19th, they're going to hear a summary and unilateral judgment by a, by a single administrator saying, this is what is going to happen in phase three. It'll simply be an update of where we are in the conversation and what, um, if there are recommendations to share of things that are being considered, we would we would absolutely do that at that time. Um, so that's where we're at with, with Hopkins. I just want to uh, comment that I, I think I mentioned this last time, but I would fully expect that we took the same care in um, revising the plan uh, if revisions were to take place and a review of the, the plan in the same kind of way that we um, did over the summer uh, before approving any major modifications. Mm -hmm. I too am a little bit uh, um, wary of um, uh, playing fast and loose with lots of different variables at play at this moment with the worldwide pandemic. And I'm, I have a lot of confidence in our uh, teachers and our administrators in um, really um, challenging our long held assumptions uh, about certain things like, uh, well, taking the testing example, uh, you could expect that students test in their cohort rooms with lots of noise. You could um, expect that maybe there are other spaces where students might take that test for that moment. Maybe you, because there are remote learners who are taking the test at home and there is now this honor system and a code of conduct around expectations, perhaps it would have been just as fine for the student to, or all students to have taken that test um, after they went home. So there's, that's just three examples right there, I bet if we had a concerted effort to imagine another five to 10, we could probably do that. But it's, we're not here to um, imagine those um, solutions or micromanage. Um, clearly, you're, you know, the educators that we have um, can imagine and, and come up with those solutions. But I'm, um, I'm trusting that um, we'll be able to, um, you know, uh, what I've seen of the school is the um, the ability to rapidly iterate and come up with some um, pretty creative solutions um, uh, it, just in time that don't require major modifications of the plan. So I'm uh, eager to continue to see how our schools do that. Yeah, and I'm going to take a moment with this to, uh, to just say thank you what other people have said to the faculty, to the staff, to our families our school committee, everybody, our administrators who've been involved with this, and, and really to, I don't know, lack of a better word, brag about our district just a little bit. I mean, as much as we're thinking about, okay, what's working, what needs adjustment, and constantly always trying to get better, improve, be flexible, we are one of the few districts that is open for business. We're open for business. The majority of elementary students, and it is not the majority of middle and high school, but again, we're trying to safely solve around this idea of how can we think about the schedule in a way that is responsible and still you know, addresses, tries to get to our desired goal. We're one of the few places open for business. The majority of our elementary students attend school in person five days a week for the majority of each day. I mean, people really need to take that in. You read the paper, and I'm not implying that everything is perfect every moment. It is, our staff are working like crazy. Every day is a new, I, what the other day, Jen and I were picking up barriers. Maybe some of our parents remember the, the little blowing barrier problem. It's solved now. So every day, there are little challenges that we don't expect. But it's, it's really incredible. It, what we're doing is really incredible and matters greatly for families and children that need in-person learning every day. There is not another district around us that is even close with providing this. And simultaneously, our teachers are respecting and meeting the needs of people who for very good reason have chosen to remain remote. And they're serving all of them every day and this is mind-boggling i mean really i just invite people read the paper 
watch other meetings, see, see where things are at all around us. So this is a profound success. Far from perfect, it's definitely not easy. And there are a lot of things that could be better for everybody. But my goodness, and it's a success in that we've also been doing this since September 16th with children, since the end of August with staff. So we are now at eight weeks with kids in buildings, actually more than that. I mean, a ton of credit goes to our special educators who worked over summer school and our special education director. And part of the reason that we have children in the, in the building in the fall is because we had children in the building in the summer for, for uh, extended school year services. So thank you, thank you, thank you to the leadership in our special education department. Yeah, it's, it, is, it is really impressive. And our families were allowed to keep going because families like Ms. Dowd said, are being responsive and responsible. If the nurse calls and says, it, or, and they call us, right? So we don't have school transmission. Just, I, I, I just really invite the community to say, wow, and this is some really this is this is some really good work that our faculty is doing and i'm profoundly grateful for it and really proud to be a part of it and it's um i'm just grateful to lead alongside our administrators and and our educators and our association uh if if people don't realize how blessed we are in hadley we are really really blessed and i invite you to look around so we'll have more updates for you on november 19th and um, look forward to keeping people informed and seeking feedback on uh, what, what's next, assuming, and I always want to make sure that people hear us, it is not a given that things just, we just move forward because there's a calendar, right? So I think we can transition into the next part. We pay attention to the data. The data still look good. I mean, they go down, they go up, but this data still look good, but that, that is always subject to change, right? I just always need to remind families of that, that this is what we're paying attention to. Um, and let me see if I can uh, share my I'll screen talk here. That while you're sharing your screen, yeah. Annie, uh, yeah, yeah, a big here, here to everything you just said. Kudos, the wow! I absolutely echo it. I, I also am just, I'm so encouraged by the participation we've seen on on these meetings. Um, I think about a year ago, it was all of us sitting in the band room with empty chairs uh, for the most part. So it's great to see all of the parents and families that are able to um, participate in these meetings with us, as well as representatives from the town. We've really appreciated, you know, Jane Nevin Smith, your um, participation in these meetings, the Board of Health representation that we've had, which just helps, you know, us in collectively. Uh, evaluating information, knowing that we have the support uh, system in place, thinking about the, the the structural activities that had to happen at those school buildings in terms of uh, air purifiers, all of those things that needed to be in place. We knew that we also had the support of the town going into all of those activities. So I just, um, I want to echo that. All right, here's the data. Um, and I did mention at the, the top of this call that there is an announcement on the um, department's home page that the town cases are not going to be posted until tomorrow. So that data is not available tonight for us to look at, um, but you do have the, the county data in there if you wanna to speak to that, Annie. Yes, so I will update the um total case count in Hadley and the case count in the last 14 days in Hadley tomorrow. And this will be in the weekly uh, newsletter. And then I will also have the graphs there as well. So we've seen in our average daily incidence rate per 100,000 in Hampshire County, an increase from last week to this week of four until to five. And the testing positivity rate also went up from 0.27 to 0.33. So uh, an increase in the district data, um, which, We'll also, that doesn't get updated until later tonight by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, and I did have a parent ask a really good question about, gosh, you know, for example, I include districts from Hampshire County and I highlight districts that are not in Hampshire County, but I purposefully included them because 
their high school is following the regular schedule and mixing students. You can see I originally had, for example, Athol, all districts that are not in Hampshire County, but had schedules where students were mixing. The highlighted ones, Frontier and Ware, have a, a at least 50% of their student population present. So I removed the highlights from Athol because they're not there yet. They don't have a lot of high school students in person right now. So it's highlighted if they have at least 50%. So a parent asked the question, well, you know, South Hadley's in here, but South Hadley's 100% remote. So um, the data could be misleading for people, right? If they're thinking that, that a district has in person and has zero case count, right? I, I can say this, that these data are taken directly from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. The district, so that means DESE, that the district has indicated that there are some students, it doesn't have to be the majority, it doesn't have to be, but that there are some students in hybrid or in person. So it could be that it's a very small portion of special populations, it could be, um, I don't know how many. So I don't know what models are in each of these districts. I wanna be clear with the community. I think the, merit, the parent did an excellent uh, point when they emailed me. I, I'm not saying that I know how many students are present for in-person or any sort of hybrid instruction, how many or how few. I just take the data from Hampshire County and now I, uh, when people go to the workbook, which is public, you can see every single week, um, whoops, sorry about that, you can see every single week and then for the newsletter letter, I just do the previous three weeks. And that's our data for this week. And uh, it'll be in the newsletter. And even though the school committee does not meet next week, it will be updated weekly, this dashboard, and it will be in the newsletter. Thanks, Annie. So yeah, we meet in another two weeks. Um, mm -hmm. And these data, uh, at least the county data, um, is still within our thresholds. Uh, that's what we look for um, every week. And we'll look at the town data again uh, tomorrow when it's updated or, or for the newsletter. All right. Is there anything else we need to cover on the update of, of the phase oh, or the data? The, I forgot about the testing, yes. So yeah. um, so there, I am bringing this up here only because I mentioned it at a past school committee meeting. The federal, the FDA approved uh, an antigen test that's referred to as abbott Binix now testing. They approved it um, to be used in schools for diagnostic purposes and uh, there are about 2 million tests that were made available for the Commonwealth. So school districts had to, interest, had to indicate if they might be interested in being a pilot district for using these tests. Our school nurses spoke with our consulting physician, Dr. Jonathan Swab, 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 Schwab, how did I get that right? Um, from Northampton Area Pediatrics. And the nurses and the doctor agreed that it actually doesn't make sense for us to participate in this pilot because what this testing is for is for symptomatic individuals who give their consent to be tested and that even if a test came back negative, they still would need to be, if they were symptomatic, they would still need to be sent for a PCR test. So for the amount of work that it would require to actually administer the test and to get uh, the kind of licensing for the nurses to administer the test for the value that we would get from that. So currently now if somebody demonstrates symptoms or exhibits symptoms, excuse me, they, uh, the nurses make a clinical assessment, communicate if it's a child, communicate with the family, if it's a um, faculty member, speak directly with the faculty member, uh, folks leave campus, they get tested. As you can see, we've had no tests, uh, no positive cases in the schools since we've started. So this has been effective, it's been working, and having being a part of this pilot would not improve that system demonstrably, but it would um, add additional work, and they're not saying this, I would say to a very small team, right? I mean, God bless our nurses, we have two of them that are doing everything for us. So that's the update on that. We will not participate in the pilot for this particular kind of testing for this purpose. Uh, we still are encouraging the state legislature to figure out how 
to come up with a statewide surveillance, uh, surveillance testing system for K through 12 students and faculty and staff that of course um, people would have to would consent to participate in but we're hoping that the state makes some movement on that okay anything else on these two topics no not for me thank you all right um let's see we'll do the business manager reports the next time we meet which can I just say is 11 19. You 19, see there's a typo right. in there. It's not on Sunday the 15th. It's 11 19. Thanks that we, for that. <laughs> no problem. All right. Uh, we'll move into school committee reports and discussion items. Um, policy committee. We have some first reads for tonight. Yes, you have. Uh, you do. You have first reading of what the policy committee reviewed last time. So just a first reading for the school committee. Any, um, anything on those that you'd like to in particular highlight for us? These are um, starting with policy ACAB, anti-discrimination, anti-harassment through CHC regulations. These were for the most part, all of the changes were changes that were recommended uh, either by MASC, their updates by MASC, which is all the red track changes, or um, very few that were recommended by the attorney. There aren't uh, substantive changes here. It's really just language changes that were recommended by MASC. Okay. Any questions? Because um, Humera and Tara, you both are policy subcommittees. So Ethan, any questions from you? All right, and these will come no. back. Okay. These will come back for a second read where we can get clarification um, and deliberate on that. Great. All right. Um, anything else from policy subcommittee? Okay. Tri board finance. Yes. All right. So, Annie, I'm going to uh, hopefully you can help me out here, but I'm going to run through kind of a little bit of the conversation that happened at the tri board. Um, and this is kind of town information. Select board has kind of decided to keep tax bills at the same amount. Uh, they're going to do that by reducing the tax rate, I believe, from twelve eighty-seven to twelve dollars flat. Um, they did this by utilizing the the money that we returned to the town, um, as well as uh, taking some money from stabilization to kind of make this work. Um, they're hoping to see obviously revenues bounce back in in, in twenty twenty one. Um, to kind of replenish stabilization, but there was some conversation about, um, or they did reference the idea of potential cuts in 2021, um, and, and referenced also the idea of level funding in 2021 with the budget if uh, the revenue didn't bounce back in the way that they hoped. Annie, anything else? Did I did I miss something? I, so. I also know that Jane is here too, so we could. That's true. Invite. Yes. She has, yeah. So I think I don't know if Jane. Am I putting you on the yeah. spot or do you want to add anything or clarify yeah. anything? There I am. Yes, I just encourage all of you to come to town meeting on Saturday yes. at one o'clock at the fire station, not not this Saturday, a week from Saturday. Mm -hmm. And 14th. we are going to be talking about the budget. We are going to be talking about options for um, doing the tax rate because the question of whether we should actually use the stabilization fund this year or wait until next year um, and spread out people's the taxes will have to grow so do we do it all at once next year or do we let some relief happen this year and that that I'm sure that will be a big discussion on the meeting floor so I hope to see you all there yeah, and I will also just echo some of what was said here so the community is clear and I don't want to speak on behalf of the select board, but the select board did not at any point recommend raising tax rates. And the issue is the good news in Hadley is that property valuations have increased. So even if you don't raise the rate, a bill can increase, even if they don't increase the tax rate, if one's valuation increases. Um, so that I also just want to be clear about that. There's, there's uh, the select board is making, uh, at no point did they, were they really talking, I think, about raising uh, rates. It's just uh, looking at the fact that valuations have increased 
significantly in some cases, um, which is good news. And the consequence of that is that um, it translates into higher taxes. Well, and they can't raise rates unless, because there's an absolute amount of money they're allowed to divide the base across. So because values have increased, that's why the taxes have gone down from 1287 to either 1215 or 12, depending on whether or not they use stabilization funds. Got it. Thank you for that, Jane, and thanks, Ethan. Anything else from Tribord or Finance? All right. Um, capital planning and fields. I know Paul wasn't able to join us uh, tonight, but we do have an item in two weeks that we will be talking about regarding um, the fields, and that will be um, posted as part of our agenda regarding um, some of the usage of land, uh, which is really just for us to discuss, uh, but it will ultimately need to go back to select board um, at the end after we've had a chance to talk through it. Uh, so we'll have that conversation in two weeks when we meet again. Uh, collaborative, Humera, I know you sent us some information. Yes, uh, I recently forwarded you uh, a newsletter, the, their latest newsletter, and you'll see something that I mentioned uh, in a previous meeting was that the executive director um, will be leaving the organization. This newsletter announcement uh, mentions that. And um, if anyone is interested on the CES website, you can see uh, a word about that. Um, he's staying on through the end of December. Um, and there is a search that begins right about now, beginning of November, uh, for his replacement. And um, a senior level person at the organization will be um, leading the organization until um, his replacement is found. Thanks, and um, if folks are interested in looking at that, it is uh, CES stands for the Collabor Collaborative for Educational Services, and their website is collaborative.org. All right, um, and I will also add too that before we talk about negotiations, I will be attending the MASC uh, annual meeting um, Saturday, and I will report out on that um, when we meet again in two weeks. All right, and negotiations. So we do have, it's that time of year where we have collective bargaining coming up for um, two uh, groups, Unit A uh, and Unit D. Unit A are the teachers and Unit D are our um, ESPs or educational support personnel uh, that we have two different units, two different um, contracts. Uh, and collective bargaining, what happens with that is we designate uh, two school committee members to serve on each of those units negotiations, um, only two, and, and either one or both of us are, are present at those meetings uh, where we meet with um, representatives from that unit and any legal or um, uh, educational association council uh, would meet with us, and that is to discuss the next uh, contract and any contract updates which are typically, Annie, correct me if I'm wrong, they're usually three years, I think? Uh, the Unit A and Unit D contracts normally run for three years. Yeah, yeah, so they don't come around again until uh, a while. Um, and, you know, the meetings are always, uh, you know, collectively planned to make sure everybody's available. Uh, I'm assuming we would be doing those virtually, which maybe that makes it um, easier for some of us to attend. Uh, and um, there is a set, there's ground rules as part of this process. So there is a, a set list of those rules and it does entail, you know, if for whatever reason we're not able to come to a conclusion on certain things, then we don't just go on meeting forever. There's rules around that too and how to um, come to uh, kind of mediation around those particular items um, that are being discussed. So what we need though are two representatives um, to serve as the subcommittee for unit A and then under two, it can be two, it can be a mix, it uh, doesn't matter uh, for subcommittee negotiations um, for unit D. And I just want to clarify one thing, Heather, the one thing that's different about this, because you 
had said many times it's a school committee member and the other person can, is like an alternate so one or both can be present for negotiations both people must be present or we have to cancel it's a subcommittee in which the quorum is the two are the two people so uh, the two That's school committee people, people always have to be present great um, i'm happy to serve on the unit a committee um, so I'll throw my name in there for that. And I don't know if Paul, um, we could follow up with him since he's not here as to whether he would serve on one or the other of these as well. I'd be happy to serve on A as well. I did unit D three years ago, so I'd be happy to do A this time with you, Heather. Thanks, Tara. I'm happy to be a part of D if that needs to happen. We will definitely need two people for D. So, all right, Ethan, that sounds great. And Humera, would you like us to follow up with Paul to see if he um, would like to be the other representative for D? Let's um, gauge, let's gauge his interest in doing so, and then um, we can make a determination at that time. Okay, and then we can bring it back in two weeks, Annie, and at least uh, just get back to folks saying um, we've got Unit A. Uh, confirmed sure all right great so um, we do have some action items um, those appointments Annie do we need to have a motion for those or are, are you do when it's a subcommittee that you're creating the chair the school committee creates and that for which a quorum is required you take a motion okay. if it's something that I'm asking for help with you don't have to the quorum's not required got it <laughs> all right so um, can I get a motion to appoint um, myself and Tara to the negotiation subcommittee for Unit A? So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, we'll hold on uh, Unit B. Um, going back through the action items, first reading of policies. Uh, that's not a motion, that's just that's informational. Correct. Uh, we didn't have any questions, so we'll move on. Uh, I do need a motion for the approval of the accounts payable warrants that were submitted uh, for October 2020. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Hi. Hi. I will abstain from that. Um, is there a motion to approve the warrants submitted in October 2020? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, and then we had two sets of minutes, uh, September 17th and October 1st. Uh, any questions, uh, clarifications needed on those minutes? Hearing none, is there a motion uh, to approve the minutes for September and for October? So moved. Seconded. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, we have gone through all of the action items and our next meeting is um, in two weeks, uh, the 19th at 5.30. And um, we do not have anything after this meeting. We have no policy subcommittee or executive <laughs> session or anything. So it's really, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? I wonder before we motion to adjourn, if I could make a quick announcement that um, the, the group of people who have been meeting to discuss and learn about racism and take uh, action or form teams to, to address certain things uh, is called Hadley Learns. It's separate from the town equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. Um, but this is a, a community that meets uh, every three, four, five weeks um, and has a book discussion and then meets uh, and forms teams and people join teams that work on different things like anti-racism curriculum in schools or what might training look like for town employees from teachers to DPW workers um, to um, safety in schools um, or in the community. Um, and so the next uh, date has been scheduled and um, there is a RSVP form that's circulating. The date is November 15th between 1030 to 12. That's a Sunday, Sunday the 15th between 10:30 and 12 on Zoom. Um, and Annie, if I could ask you to add that to your next super 
uh, superintendent committee report, I'd be very grateful. There's a book on K-12 related matters. There's a book, um, Kent, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Kendi, and also um, the book White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. And these are wonderful conversations that are not recorded and provide a great entry point for people to learn more about the way in which racism manifests itself in schools or in town. Thank you. you I will add it to the newsletter. Can you include the names of the books, Annie, to Hey Mary? Can you provide that just in case people can't go to the meeting but are interested in reading some of those? Definitely. Yes. The books are usually listed in Annie's superintendent announcement. And also, when you click on the RSVP link, you can um, not only um, see those books again, but also click on um, 90 minute videos that so that you might not have to read the book, but you can get a full sense of the concepts just by watching and then join. Awesome. Great, thank you. Thanks. Any other announcements before we adjourn? I thought Humera was going to announce that she'd like to have a policy subcommittee meeting, but I guess that wasn't <laughs> I think, good. I think she's good. <laughs> Don't, there's still time. There's still time. <laughs> motion to adjourn. We're, uh, yeah, motion to adjourn. So moved. Instead. All in Instead. favor. Aye. 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 Thanks, guys.